Hello and welcome to Conscious TV with me Liz Scott and today I'm going to be interviewing the interviewers of Conscious TV and also the founders Ian and Renata McNay. It's great to meet up with you both today. Hello. Hi. So I was really curious actually about the both of you because we watch Conscious TV, we see you interviewing all these fascinating people and there's always a bit of a question about what do you get from it? What, what's your background? So today we're going to find out a bit about that. But first of all, just re remind me about Conscious TV. When, when did it all start? Well, we started making our first programmes almost exactly three years ago in this studio where you now are, RPL Studios and Act. And, and uh, yes, I can remember the first day Renata wasn't with me and uh, I did four interviews and actually they weren't very good, so they've disappeared from Conscious TV now, but it was the beginning of a learning curve, and also it was the beginning of a kind of a, a dream that was gradually crystallising in our minds, and, and it was the first time it, it got into form in terms of uh, actually making programmes. And what's it like for you actually meeting up with all these wonderful people, people that you admire and respect and have read their books? Um, it's actually very natural. Uh, and, um, you know, some of them have, have really big names and then they come here and they feel completely natural and, and easy to talk to and uh, I know a lot of people admire us to meet all these people and it's great to be in this position. <laughs> yeah. So my curiosity, I suppose, is a bit about how it all started for you and a bit about your spiritual journeys as well. So let me start with you first of all, Ian, and, and going right back to your humble beginnings, you were born and brought up, well, born in Scotland, but brought up in London. So you're a Londoner at heart, really. Yeah, we all left um, Scotland when I was five, and we went, moved to South London, and that's where I went to school, and, uh, and I started working in London, yes, when I was 16. And... Uh, and uh, I always, I suppose I was always looking to do something different and I started off being an accountant which doesn't sound very exciting but I was always looking to see what the potential of being an accountant was and when I, when I, um, I was trained as an accountant and when I finished that I got a job uh, for a film company because I thought well that, that would be interesting and glamorous but of course I was the accountant and it didn't involve going out on sets or visiting studios, it was very much administration but I learned quite a lot, and then I, I, I liked music, so I thought I'd get into music. So I went to work for a recording studio for two years, and then I got a job at a record company, Bell Records, which was a very successful record company, uh, again as their accountant. And then I was offered a job as a, a general manager of another record company. So I did that, and then I started my own record company in... in um, well, I was, how long ago was that? It was 19... I can't remember the date now, but I was 32 years old when I started it. Uh, 1978, it must have been. I started my own company. It was very much just me on my own. But Interweave there was very much a, a kind of a spiritual journey. And um, I started doing TM when I was uh, probably in my late 20s because I wasn't, I wasn't all that healthy, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly sick, but I would get a lot of colds and things, and I was often quite nervous, and I just felt that I needed to relax more, and I thought there must be more to life than, than what I was experiencing, even though I was quite successful in terms of my career was moving forward well. And then I, uh, I did TM for a few years, that's with the Maharishi, meditating for 20 minutes in the morning and the evening, repeating a silent mantra. And I got a bit from that, and then I thought I wanted a bit something more, a bit more dynamic. So then I got involved with what was called the Rajneesh movement. I became a disciple of Bhagwan, Re, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, uh, who's now known as Osho. He's dead now, of course. And that was a bit more dramatic. The meditations were very active, and it involved very much looking at myself, at my process, at my emotions, why I thought what I thought, why I acted the way I acted. And that took me much deeper. Um, and then I started uh, 
I made a big step then. I'd already started my own business when I was 32. It was fairly successful. And I just knew that I had to go more into my spiritual path, if you like, my spiritual mm -hmm. journey. So I actually left my own business. I didn't know at the time how long it would be for, but I pretty much handed over everything to... I had a couple of fellow directors and some employees, employees handed everything over to them. And I um, started to travel with um, one of the main teachers who'd been with uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh Osho, who was uh, Paul Lowe. I went to live in a community with him for a time in northern Italy. And uh, I had some great adventures. I was traveling the world with him and as his kind of organizer and uh, meeting lots of fascinating people. So that really took me into depth in my spiritual search. And then after four years of traveling, we were in Holland and um, there was a seminar and uh, Renata was there. So, so really then, if we, if we look back, what, what started out as I suppose maybe a curiosity and dabbling with TM just seemed to broaden and deepen and you became more and more intrigued and wanting to search further and deeper into yourself? Well, I, I, the more I learnt, the more I experienced, the more I knew that this wasn't it. So it was as if something inside me was trying to find it, whatever it was, and we could say that at some point I decided it was enlightenment or awakening or self-realization, although I didn't always give it those names. I didn't always understand it, what it was, but I knew something in me wasn't complete and I wasn't prepared to settle for second best. So I kept, in my way, in my world, looking and moving forward. And actually, you, you talk about it, and it's, it's a really fascinating story, but I would imagine quite big step to start a, a record company and, and to move away from it and to, to investigate spirituality elsewhere in the world, I would imagine that was quite a big step for you. Well, starting my own company just seemed completely obvious because I wasn't actually enjoying working for other people. So I thought the only way I'm not going to work for other people is to start my own business. And I started it in the uh, first wave of punk in the UK, 1975, and... Uh, Within two years, I had a top 40 album, which ended up selling a million copies. So I got, I got to be successful fairly quickly. Um, and it just all seemed quite obvious, actually, to do that. To actually, to, but to move on from that into the spiritual search, did that seem obvious? Well, it was, that spiritual side was always there, because while I had my own business, I was meditating, I was going to workshops, I was going to teachers and listening to what they had to say. So I, I was, it was very much part of my life. Yeah. I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn more about myself and life constantly. I wanted a real to learn. thirst for learning there. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think that kind of contrasts, in a way, Renata, with, with your story. Mm -hmm. um, you were born and brought up in Vienna. Yes. And um, I don't know what you would call it, whether it's a spiritual awakening, but, but much more abrupt rather than the gradual journey that Ian seemed to go on. So uh, w at what stage did you start on your journey, would you say? What, what would happen to you? Well, um, I, it took me a long time. And actually, I wasn't looking for a spiritual journey. I was thrown into it. That's how I feel. I was, and the reason why was because I was already married when I was 19. I had my first child when I was 20 and um, I was very fortunate. I had uh, my first husband gave me the feeling I'm the queen of the castle. I have the most important job in the world by being his wife and the mother of our children and the housewife. And I completely went into it and, and you know, the f just being with the family and being in nature and living my life very simple and beautiful um, was completely fulfilling for me. And um, I think I was 38 uh, or was 39 when a friend of mine suggested I go to a spiritual seminar and um, where, where he 
where he's going, and he was a friend of, of the family. And uh, first, I was not interested in spiritual seminar. I said, yes, go. I think that's really important for you. And, um, and I remember my husband my, had to go to America for a business trip. And normally, we were so melted, I would go on every business trip with him. And I decided, no, I stay at home. And uh, my children went on to camps. And I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I called the train station, booked a ticket for the night train to the seminar. It just, just came out like of nowhere. And I had this very strong feeling I need to do that. And I started packing my things. And in this moment, my husband calls from America. I said, Mubi, I'm going to a seminar in Amsterdam. And he said, please, do everything you like, but don't go there. And I said, don't worry about it. I'll be back before you come. And off I went. And the next interesting thing was, also completely out of my nature, uh, something in me said, whatever is going to happen there, I'm going to be open for it. Now, I never ever thought that, had this thought before. So here I went to the seminar, and it was all very strange for me. I never was in contact in an, with, in, with a big group in a, in a very intimate way, sharing what's going on with us and so forth. And uh, when the spiritual teacher gave lectures, I was just sitting there, he spoke on consciousness, and I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. But as I was looking out of the window, there was this beautiful, huge uh, linden tree. And all of a sudden, I started to feel this, the life in the tree, as if I would be the tree, life going through the leaves. You know, it was like, I asked, where am I? And in this moment, all these questions start, started to come up. Well, who am I? And what is this world? And what is God? Boom! You know, I was confronted with all this question. I didn't have an answer. And um, the seminar went by, and I, I, I met Ian, and I was invited by him and by the spiritual teacher to visit them in America because they obviously felt something was opening in me and I, I knew I had to do that and I went home and two days later my husband came and my children came I set them in front of me and said I need to go I, I just need to follow something. There's such an urge to find out who I am and what it is. And I have had all these feelings, I need to go. And it was a huge shock for my husband. And my one of my son looked at me and he said, Mommy, I know you have to go. And don't worry about it. We will be okay. You need to go. And Two days later, I was on a plane going to then America. Washington, yeah. Maryland. Yeah, what, the plane was Washington. Yes, Maryland, Washington, yeah. yeah. And then, um, for me, an unbelievable time started. Um, it's like every morning I woke up with something else happening, like. I was sitting one day with, with Ian on the beach. It was in Long... No, it was in Maryland. I was sitting on the beach with him, and all of a sudden I looked in my own face, and I saw my hair moving in the wind. I saw some lines in my face, and I said, Ian, I don't know where I am. I just look in my face. He didn't know either. So we spoke with the spiritual teacher and he said, it looks like you're leaving your body. 
And so I found out that I was leaving my body and I could leave my body any time I wanted to. I just could drop into this state where I was just out of my body. And this real adventure started where I, you know, I would visit other countries and other planets and um, other realms. And you could visit your children. When yeah, Vienna. I was just going into. And what I also could, I could go to Vienna and see my children. And the part which was leaving could touch them. And I, s I could see my husband and he would look up and call my name. He could feel me. Just brings tears in my eyes. Uh, but of course, um, he didn't know what it was. And um, so I had great adventure. And with that, and another morning I woke up and somebody would come in the room and I could look through the person's body. It was like I was x-raying this person. I saw where this person was ill and where their energy was blocked. And uh, in the same moment, I felt this strong heat in my hand. And, uh, you know, many, many other things, Satori experiences and past and future collapsed in the, in the moment and, and so forth. Um, and at the same time, I also was confronted with emotions, with my fear and, 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 and you know, something started to happen then between us and we started to fall in love. <laughs> just, just before, because I'd love to hear the love story, but just before that, I'm really curious, because if I try and imagine yeah. what that experience must be like to have an out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. I think a part of me would be very scared, and I'm talking about me here, and I'm just yeah. curious to know, what, what was it like for you? I wasn't scared. Um, when I, when I realised what I was doing, it was amazing. We st I started to play games with my husband. He would, hide, he would hide something in one room and I was in the other room and I could watch what he was doing. <laughs> I, could, I could do so many things unseen. <laughs> is, that, is that something you can still do now? Um, there was a point where I stopped it. Right. And there was a reason why I stopped it because I... Um, I completely started losing ground uh, and I started doing giving seminars then on to how to leave the body and and I was really more out than inside the body and um, I planned to go back after two weeks to my family and uh, I was encouraged to stay a little bit longer because they said if you go back now you will think you, you, you dreamt all the things. Just wait till the things sta stabil stabilize. So after, after five weeks, I went back. And um, I realized then how much I have changed and how different I would see the world. And again, my, one of my sons said to me, Mommy, so everything you found out now, who you are, and what this planet is about, I always knew, but I never could talk with you about it. And, of course, we only can ever see as far as we are. And in this moment, I really could see where he is and who he is. And my husband, went through a very traumatic time and he developed chronic kidney, a chronic kidney condition and the doctor worried about it and he was in a lot of pain and after I left he thought I was completely brainwashed and he closed my bank account and he took all my jewelry away and and then I said to him, Mubi, let me put my hands on your kidney. And he said, okay. And I put my hands on his kidney. And he had a very classic reaction, healing reaction. 
And the next day he went to the doctor and he said, a miracle happened. The kidneys are completely clear. What did you do? And from this moment on, he ever, only ever supported me. He, <laughs> he realized that I wasn't brainwashed. Something happened to me. And um, in his big love for me, he also started to include then Ian. And um, but I want to stop for the moment. <laughs> I can see this really touches you, yeah, and it, it touches does. me as you relate it. It's, it's a fascinating story, and and I'm really curious to go. To, we sort of paused on that the love aspect here between you two because you you did fall in love. That that was an aspect of what grew. Yeah. So Ian. Can you take up the story around how you, how you got together and realised that, that you were wanting to share the journey of life together? Well, you know, something actually happened in Holland, to be honest, beforehand. Um, so that was when we first really connected on that level. Um, and then it's like anything, like relationship, they can be wonderful to start with. And then you get to know the person better and you find actually, well, they're on their best behaviour and then you realise there's things that are not quite as they uh, as seemed and, and vice versa as well. So I think one of the things that we tried to do, and we maybe didn't always get it right, but we really tried to, in our own ways, work through that. And maybe work's the wrong word, but to intelligently look at what was happening and try and... You know, my thing these days, and I get much more clearer now, is always trying to see the other person's point of view. Put myself in their shoes, if you like. Try to understand what are they feeling? Why are they the way they are? And at that point, I wasn't necessarily so mature at that. But there was, there was, certainly, the, there was certainly a strong love there. And with that, I think there was a certain intelligence that it's not just about being in love. It's not just about a physical attraction. It's also about including that in the bigger picture, which could be your spiritual development, but also finding out why things about the other person annoy you and, and the other way around too, and seeing if you can work through that and seeing if you can be together in a relatively harmonious way. I think that that was something also which I learned very early on, that... I cannot change him. I cannot change anything in our relationship. The only thing I can change is myself. And that's what I have to focus on. Then things, and he does the same, then things will fall in place. Or not, as the case may yeah, be. But you have did. to trust in the process, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and so as, as you've developed, and if we go back then to, to, to you, you, you you've you found that you had were able to heal. Yes. You were doing workshops on the out of body I experience. I started to do workshops in America. Was that on healing or the no, out of, on out of uh, living, living your, your body. body? And they were very spectacular and very successful. And the way I did it, I would leave my body and then speak to the group, and they could tune in into the vibration I was in and use it to have this experience. Now, I did it because I thought it's such a valuable experience to have, to realize we are not only the body. Yeah. And so, um, so I did that, and Ian, Ian, Ian did that with me as and, well. And Ian, just, I've got to ask, have, were you able to go no. outside of your body? So, no. that's, so that's not an but experience But I was happy to support had. Renata in, yes. in her talent, in her... Right. Whatever we call it, yeah, ability, yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, as this was was going on, I, I, the healing energy was so strong, I could not bend my fingers anymore. And Ian would say, you need to work with this energy and you need to work. And I was so scared. I said, how can I heal people? How can I work with this energy? I don't know how to do that. And, um, and... We had arguments over that, and uh, one day I was sitting on the sofa and I said, and I really meant it then, whoever is out there who needs my help, I'm ready. 
So that was another sentence. And it was fascinating, like the, we were then in Los Angeles and the telephone started to ring and people started to book session and I still don't know how they found out. And I realized, you know, once you make yourself available, it carries a certain energy which is bringing back. And so I started to do healing work and you know how it is, there's somebody there who who was from Russia, who said you need to come to Russia and to Germany. And all of a sudden we were traveling, we were living two years out of our suitcase, just going from one event to the next. And I had often a few hundred people in one room to heal, to put my hands on. Often my mind would say, how do you know that works? You know, still the doubt would come in. But, um, you know, I had a couple of people I could help out of the wheelchair and did many other things. And um, the more successful I was, the more stronger I became in myself. And is that something you're still doing? Are you still a healer? No. Um, I And that was a was a process in itself, you know, when I started healing I thought, great, because that is my personality. I, I constantly want to help somebody, I constantly want to heal somebody, so I thought, great, I got this gift because I need to heal the world. <laughs> and that's how I ventured out. And of course I learned, I learned by time what an illness is. And sometimes a person needs an illness and who I am to take it away then. So it was a whole process, you know, whatever I went to it, I learned about it and I developed with this, this gift I had. And, uh, and uh, then Ian, at one point, Ian decided he needs to go back to England to, to, to take, his cover, uh, take control of his company again. So I traveled on my own and... Uh, and um, did my did my work, and um, but there was the point where I felt completely burned out, mm. and my doctor then said, "You need to stop. You have a great gift, but you never learned to use the gift for yourself." Mm. And um, so then, I, then an adventure started to heal myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll pause on that point because you, yeah. so you came back to London mm -hmm. and you were... Yeah. Well, I'd been travelling longer than Renata because I was yes. travelling before I met her. So how many years travelling would you say that you've been doing? Do you um, think? Well, I travelled for about four years without any kind of proper base. Yeah. And then um, actually, although I kept going for a further two years with Renata, I did have a small flat in London. We had the house in Germany that we also were at sometimes. But we were doing a lot of flights and traveling a lot and I just I know one of the things for me was very much um, about being in the world but not of the world the thing that you know I'd learned a lot I had a lot of experiences but I wanted to be I love being in the marketplace I love somehow being in the middle of something and then seeing can I keep my center can I still come from the place that has a certain wisdom and not get caught up in all the dramas. That seemed to me the next step for me. And also, although my company was fine and the person that was actually running it had done fine, I wanted to expand again. I just saw opportunities and I wanted to take it to a new stage, which I did. So, so. I mean, from what I'm hearing here then, it sounds like it was a very, a, a sort of a very healthy way of, of almost saying, rather than being on a spiritual journey where you are physically on a journey living out of a suitcase this is about coming back to normality whatever that is yeah. and actually bringing your spirituality into that consciousness and seeing how you live in the world with that and still enjoy the world that you that you enjoy yeah because they weren't really separate things for me it was all oh. it was all one in in so far as it wasn't as if when I was in business I completely forgot the spiritual side of my life. And the spiritual side of my life I could still make intelligent decisions like when we were 
doing our seminars together there was a sometimes a financial aspect obviously to it so I could come from that from a sensible point of view and uh, so this thing of balance has always been it's always been important to me that you somehow have a balance in life and being grounded and yet seeing that the overall picture is huge it's so immense you can hardly begin to imagine it but also having a certain ground and it, it sounds as though you have a real enjoyment around the business that you run there's a real sense that you you, you you sort of relish that involvement yeah i think i think you know it's interesting that, that the guest we had before um today was uh, my snyder and um he was very much talking about expansion he was born blind to to deaf parents and he was so determined to get his eyesight back and and now he's a great teacher and a healer and it, it, it is about very much i think finding your own potential and and just seeing how that can grow and that's what i always felt and uh it's interesting because I've been in the music business most of my life and people say it's a terrible, ruthless business. Well, that actually isn't my experience. Yes, there's some terrible, ruthless people, but I haven't come across them very much. And the people I've dealt with, they're not always easy. Dealing with artists is not always easy. But, but most of my experiences have been very, very, very positive somehow. Certain things work out, certain things don't. But it, it, it's very much an attitude of how you go into something. It's, if you can go into it with a positive and a, an expanded attitude, also realistic, you've got to be grounded. No good going up here with that, otherwise you just get you just get lost and you probably do get taken for a ride. But if you go in with that balance, you can actually actually uh, achieve a lot. And I say achieve, I mean by that it's to do with your potential. It isn't necessarily to do with, with, with trying to get lots of money or anything else. It's to do with the potential that's your uniqueness your unique manifestation of the whole. Well, so really it's, it's the focus on that potential for you that really has allowed you to develop yourself on your spiritual journey whilst also being in, in the, record, the world of the record industry. Yeah, and that was the, you know, we might come into more detail of Conscious TV later, but that was very much for, for both, well, for me particularly and also for Renata. You know, I just turned 60 when we had the idea to do it. You know, like... I wanted a new challenge somehow, a new challenge in the area I'm interested in, which mm. is meeting people and consciousness. Where can I take it? Where can we take conscious TV? Don't really know, but we'll see where the adventure goes. So, so with you then, Renata, because we, we, we paused on your story where, where actually you, you'd almost been the healer and, and it was physician heal thyself and, and, and you hadn't actually done that for yourself, so you bit burnt out and yes. stopped doing the healing. Yes. What have you been doing, or how has your life been since that period of your life when you were the healing? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I still found it incredibly difficult to bring the attention to myself. That is something I'm still working on. And um, I, you know, when I started this adventure with doing seminars, it was a, a completely selfless thing. I never took care of myself, I never meditated. Um, what we started to do, uh, we both are in a spiritual school since 17 years with the Diamond Approach by Almas. Um, so we started like a proper spiritual training almost, where we started to work a lot on our unconscious, you know, what, why am I thinking, why am I having these thoughts and our unclarities and our patterns. And um, so that, that gave me a lot of fulfilling and uh, fulfillment and uh, just meditate and uh, I mean our life is always, living with this man is always busy. <laughs> <laughs> He has a very creative mind, and, <laughs> and uh, I normally follow. <laughs> and so, Conscious TV, it sounds, and you followed Ian, because it sounds as though it was Ian's, Ian was looking for a new challenge, and, and Definitely. this is what opened up for him. Yes. I mean, you know this story. We were sitting at the New Year's Eve party. And yeah, we've already covered this in another yeah, programme, but yeah. basically it was, new, it was New Year's Eve, and it was very much looking at what we hadn't done in our lives that we'd like to do. And I just... 
I just thought that most of TV was just not very good at all, and I just thought I could do better, which is a little bit like when I started my record company. I thought, well, I can do better than other people. And OK, you can say there's a certain arrogance in that, and maybe there is some truth in that, but also there was, there was, there was a genuine feeling that I could, we could create something special that was unique. And I think, I think we've done that, but I still think it's very early days. And with, with this interview is drawing to a, a close now, but I'm really curious about the future of Conscious TV. And you touched on it a little bit here, but, but where, where, is it, where is it going? Or do you just allow it to evolve? Well, that, I would say that's for me. Um, I feel there is a natural unfoldment with Conscious TV. And um, we, we are... We decided we only want to do um, interviews we personally are really interested in. And um, we get a lot of suggestions from our viewers. We follow them and if we are interested as well, then we invite the person. And it's also very much in alignment with, uh, okay, we are holding a vision, but an alignment where through nature wants to take the whole thing yeah and that's quite fascinating so for me it is i cannot look further you know it's different for him <laughs> i don't have a business, no, no business for me plan. for me it's an it's it's an unfolding yeah he has a vision he is holding well it's not a fixed vision you know it's not that there's no business plan because we're not a business because we have no income so it's only money out, but fortunately I've been quite successful in the world, so I'm able to support it, which is, which is a brilliant position to be in. And I just see the type of programmes that we make, I don't see anybody else making. There are, there are a couple of similar channels in America who are doing some good work, but in the UK I don't know anybody else that's doing what we're doing. And I think that what we bring to the interviews is we bring... We bring ourselves as completely as we can. So we researched, and with the, today, I'll, there's two other interviews after, after, after this day, we've already done one. And so there's been a lot of work gone into that, reading the books and researching, and um, we've made notes. And yet, when it comes to the interview, it's almost as if they go to one side and we sit with the person and we see what is there and that is how it unfolds and that we love because it is very much the space of being present of letting whatever is there come out and it's not done in an ungrounded way because we've done the research we to some extent know the person's history we know to some extent what they may want to talk about so it's not done in in an ignorant way in an uninformed way but it's done in a very present way, what well, we feel we do. Um. And for me, if I can come in, uh, for me, the, you know, reading the books before and writing questions down and, and doing all this research before an interview is also an energetic thing. You know, I started on an energetic level, contact this person and feel this person. And that's for me also an important aspect. So, so different and similar ways of approaching interviews and I'm hearing that the future is b both a vision that's not fixed and an unfolding, sort of a paradoxical in a way. Yes, and of course on the more organisational level uh, there is tremendous opportunity with the iPad now showing TV, there's a new, there's already a Philips and Samsung TV come out where you can get the internet on. We are running on a couple of Sky channels in the UK on satellite. We are on some cable channels overseas. There is, there is the practical side, and our good friend Eleonora helps us with that, of just getting, getting things practically done. And we are, on the practical side, we are almost overwhelmed. That's too strong a word, overwhelmed. But we are, we are stretched. full on, we are stretched with the volume of emails that come in and all the details to, to follow through. But that's part of doing it. There's, uh, there's parts that we love and there's parts that need to be done, which isn't our favourite job, but you can't have one without the other. That's the way it is. Well, I, I mean, I think that what you've offered 
with conscious TV and you know the opportunity for people like myself to experience the much longer and in-depth interviews with authors and people that we're fascinated with is something that you don't get anywhere else mm. so I'm really glad that you're doing it so thank you very much and it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you both today and to find out more about your stories and I think we could probably keep talking for the next probably five hours if we needed to, filling in all the gaps, but it's been yeah. such a, a great time with you. Thank so you. you've been watching Conscious TV with me, Liz Scott, and I've been interviewing the founders of Conscious TV, Renata and Ian McNay.